Good morning. This is Jonathan Albin, the Game Market Guru, and today we are in the <clears throat> ostensibly the second episode of season three. And today we are going to be talking about bringing NPCs to life, non-player characters. So before we uh, go into all the details, just quick overview: we will be looking at terms that I use when dealing with NPCs to be able to identify clearly what their roles are and how to use them. We're going to talk a little bit about analyzing the specific NPC that you are considering and why that con that consideration uh, should apply. Uh, we're going to look at the elements of identity, how we can define the uh, the role of that non-player character within the framework of the story that you're building. We're going to talk about how we can affect the timing and tempo of the interaction with each of those non-player characters. And we're going to also be talking about how to maintain source consistency when we are dealing with uh, recurring non-player characters or those that are integral to the story itself. We have to make sure that the uh, recognizability of that NPC is clear so that the players can identify and trust or conversely un not trust a source when you utilize it as a conveyor of information. We're going to talk a little bit also about how the use of and value of NPCs changes with the uh, focus of your uh, game, whether it be role playing with an E or role playing with two L's, and we'll go into that in more detail. And then ultimately, we're going to deal with how you can cause an interaction to occur between the players and multiple NPCs and not end up with a ton of confusion in the minds of the players and to prevent it from becoming. Uh, a single person monologue drama that plays out in front of the players, which is kind of a challenge in its own, but just how to deal with multiple NPCs in a singular encounter. So as we get ready to start, let me push back up to the beginning here in my notes, I'm ready to go. When we talk about the very nature of a non-player characters and stories, first of all, you have to talk a little bit about Role play games at a at a much lower level, and uh, please forgive me if I dive a little too shallow, so to speak, uh, for you, uh, the viewer. And if you're uh, above this point in the conversation, feel free to uh, listen to your favorite music for a couple of seconds as I cover this for the newer players, newer GMs. But first of all, we want to talk about the very purpose of a of a non-player character. As players involve themselves with the story that you have created, you want them to be able to feel that the environment is real. And to do that, human beings by nature, whether we're playing humans or not, but we as players want to uh, interact through conversation. We want to have literally ask questions and have people that can answer them. And so by necessity, a role player who takes on being a game master has to take on the role of playing a wide array of characters in character so that the players can inter interact with them. Hey, Travis, welcome to the show. Uh, we're right here at the beginning and we're talking about why somebody would want an NPC in a story. So the first thing is that you've realized that when you are interacting with the players in that role, you want to be in character. You want to allow them to see the personality and the identity of these other people that they come in contact with. When we do this, we have to first of all determine what kind of a character this individual is. And when I say character, let's, let's be very, very simplistic. If I, as a game master, had you as a character in the story, I've got to give you something to push against. So I will give you a description of a location and we'll go with something that's very classic and very simple. You're in a bar. You're sitting at a table. You clearly 
came there for the purpose of either imbibing in alcohol or at least feigning that you're imbibing alcohol for the purposes of gathering information. In either case, you're going to have to have a drink at hand. So you therefore need to interact with whoever is working inside of that facility. That's just logic proclaims that. So you're going to ask the logical question, what kind of uh, establishment is this? Are there uh, bar maids or is there a bartender or do I have to go up to the counter to order? What's the what's the parameters? And once you've done that, let's say that the situation is that the there is a barkeep. There's a uh, rather rotund gentleman about five foot five behind the counter, clean shaven, somewhat of a needle nose, bushy eyebrows and slick back hair nervously pol polishing the bar because he apparently hasn't had any but he required a drink of him when the player goes to interact with that barkeep any conversation that goes off between the player and that barkeep has to be taken care of by you the game master so you have to take on that role so even with the limited amount of information I just gave you about the barkeep you certainly have some kind of mental impression of what you're going to hear when you talk to this barkeep. So let's for, push this a little further. You actually reach the counter and you're asking, uh, hey, I'd like to get a, a small beer, a pint of small beer or something like that. Well, as the barkeep who's been nervously polishing looks up to you, he smiles curtly and says, welcome to my establishment. I am so glad you have come to join us here. You say a small beer, I will get it for you immediately. Then he turns to do whatever. In that instant of hearing the voice and the mannerisms of that barkeep, if I've done my job, so to speak, if, if, a, if a game master in his role has done his job properly, you will know exactly what that barkeep sounds like in any future conversation. Now, if I'm playing this as uh, a non-player character, the question is then begged, how much of this individual do you have to put up with? Are you, as a player, going to see this bar same barkeep every time, or is he just a generic employee that tomorrow won't be there? So let's talk a little bit about the vocabulary here. When you are speaking in the role, this is called speaking in character. So in-character presentations are about creating not only a visual, but a verbal and audio identification for, the, for this NPC. Now I'm going to be using the term NPC a lot, so to make it easier, I'm going to define NPCs a little more narrowly. I'm going to talk of them as being non-character or recurring character or st story character. Using these three terms, I hope to break down a little bit the barriers between the infinite number of people in Nikos, for example, or in, in your game world, uh, and kind of narrowing that down to the actual uh, individuals that the party members will run into. A non-character is generally someone who is provided to fill a space in the story that is a necessity, but it is not necessarily uh, critical. So, for example, if you ride up to this bar that I was speaking of with the uh, needle nose Ned, so to speak, at the counter, uh, but he's only that uh, if the when you ride up, you have to leave your horse with somebody. So there is more than more than likely going to be a stable boy. So we could actually, if if the story, if the Stable boy was critical to the story or was of high value. I might actually introduce you to him, describe him, and all of that. Otherwise, simply as, you, as you, you've arrived at the bar, the stable boy takes your horse and, and returns it back to the paddock. When a character is a non character, that is the best way to handle it. Simply state what the NPC is there for, what this non character is doing, so that the players feel the comfort of knowing there is somebody who actually did that but without all of the details signifying to them that it wasn't important now 
Travis, I, I, I know you're in the audience and I know that, that uh, you will, will kind of understand this, but if I, if I were to ask, uh, tell you about the stable boy, if you wanted to know information, you would then ask me additional questions. Quite frankly, people who are, are, are what I call um, deep or uh, intense role players will ask those kind of questions about everybody they meet. And that becomes somewhat tedious in play because when you are conveying information, if you clutter it with too many people on the, on the stage, so to speak, it becomes uh, untenable. So, <laughs> thanks, Trav. Um, <clears throat> so just remember that when you're talking about a character that is not critical to the players, and it's someone who literally could be interchanged with anybody else, give the players as little information as possible. Simply a name of a title and what that person did for them, and that should be uh, adequate. So the stable boy quickly takes your horse back to the paddock, and now you can enter the inn. Done. It's out of the way. We'll come back to non-characters in a minute because we need to differentiate them, but let's go on to the second type. Recurring characters are those characters that happen time and time again, and maybe only for a limited fashion, or perhaps uh, as almost like window dressing for a, the ongoing story. For example, in, in a Travis's game, he has a speaking scroll, and I'm not going to provide any sprawlers. Exactly. Uh, Travis point, draws up the point that if you've got too many people on stage, you become unsure of uh, which ones are too important. And so even in a very bustling city where there are a lot of individuals and therefore a lot of potential contacts and a lot of potential information gathering opportunities, it's the game master's job, if you will, to limit the scope of their contacts to as small a portion as possible so as to not cause confusion. For example, if, on the other hand, when you come up to talk to uh, bring your horse to the stable, the uh, eerily staring individual who comes to get your horse over 90 years old with a limp to the left and a, and a uh, crippled arm clutch to his chest on the right, I've now given you a whole lot of reasons to want to know more about this uh, stable boy. Number one, why are they calling him stable boy? Because he's clearly an old man. But more more to the point, I've given you a reason to want to know more and therefore pushed him to the front of the stage. So remember, again, that your non-character individuals need to be described as little as possible and uh, as infrequently as possible as, as, as you don't want to confuse too many. Uh, yes, Travis, you're right. We, we want to be able to uh, guide the player's perception. But this also becomes a trap, and we'll come back to that in a minute. So um, I'll come back to your uh, the specific point here in a second, Travis. Now, the third type of character that a player will run into in your game, I call the story character. And what a story character fundamentally is, is something that is an individual that the party members must interact with in order to forward or advance the plot or direction of the story you're creating. In ca some cases, a story character may not even be a character. It might be a, 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 a wall board that has notes on it or something. But when, that, when, I, when I'm speaking of the story character in particular, I'm talking about a personality or something that the players can interact with that's going to provide them information for the forwarding and advancement of the story in such a fashion that it be, that their interaction with him not only is ongoing, but it's also bearing a lot of information. So for example, if they are hired by a harbor master to investigate goings on on the dock, more than likely that harbor master is going to be an SC. He's going to be a story character, someone with whom they will come back and interact from time to time. There will be an exchange of information, not necessarily only one way, but it will be a methodology for the players to gain information outside of their own raw research. So when I speak of an SC, that's what I'm speaking of as compared to an RC, the recurring character, or an NC. 
Now, uh, when I speaking of characters, I'll use a couple of other terms I want to make sure you're, you're aware, aware of and familiar with, or at least recognize my use of the vocabulary. Uh, the first one is the term affectation. And an affectation is something that a person does on a regular basis within the story's interaction that becomes something that you can both identify the player by that and that character with, but also lets the players know that you're aware that they are still in character. Okay, now my nose really hurts, but that was an example of a constant affectation. A non a non character, a recurring character, or a stereo character can have an affectation. And no, this is not an affectation. This actually is my itch, my eye itching. All right. The point of an affectation is to give the players something to grab a hold of visually and mentally so that they can recognize and identify that NPC. The second, and this one's a little bit more difficult and perhaps a little argumentatively challenging, are the vocalizations. Now, as we were speaking to the barkeep earlier, he had a bit of a nasal tone and was so, so glad to have you in his establishment. This, this voice that I'm doing is just a simple example of a vocalization. Whereas, for example, this might be another one where I'm clearly attempting to do a Sean Connery. But anyway, the point is, is that vocalization is a secondary way that you can convey information about the piece, the uh, NC, SC, or RC that they're interacting with. Vocalization, I recommend you only save for RCs and SCs. Uh, occasionally, you might want to throw a, a bit of a commentary or, or a uh, response in a, vo in a vocalization from an NC just to uh, maintain red herrings within the story so they don't get too used to knowing, okay, we're talking to this guy and he's talking back with an accent, so we have to pay attention to what he says. Instead, utilize the vocalizations as a way to add flavor, add identity, and we'll come back to that a bit, to your non-player characters. Uh, the next thing we want to talk about is the, the, a term I call the character test. And utilization of a character test is a way for you to find out whether or not your work as a game master in conveying information through uh, the various NPCs is working. Uh, the character test is, by my definition, identity, emotional content, I'm sorry, emotional connection, and informational consistency. When you think about a specific NPC, a, cer a certain SC or RC in your game, think about whether or not he's meeting the, this character identification test. If he doesn't have a clear identity, this can lead to confusion. This is, for example, uh, directly from a conversation I had with one of uh, my esteemed players and uh, co-game masters, if you will, Aaron Tashetter, and we were talking about he was having difficulty in his game dealing with players becoming confused when they had conversations with his NPCs. And I've observed him in, in, in a game. I wasn't actually a character in his story, but I was uh, observing him the other day during an event, and I noted that almost all of the conversations that the players had with his non-character uh, roles were done in the third person. In other words, he would say, well, you talk to this person, and they say blah, blah. He doesn't actually go into the role as that character and say that thing. Instead, he conveyed the information about what they said. This led, of course, therefore, to confusion about remembering where that information came from because there weren't any mental cues to identify when that conversation occurred and what that conversation was about. All right. Now let's go on to the next part, and that is the analysis of the NPC you intent. Now, this is a pre-game, pre-communication with the players series of questions. And these you have to kind of 
gather in your mind mentally, maybe even taking notes on, so that when you do have the conversation about that NPC, you know which one they're speaking of and to what extent you should know information about them. So for the, example, for the first example is how big is the role? In the case of this meta story that we're building where you're at this end and you're about to get a drink from Needle Nose Ned, the story clearly has so far two non-player characters. We have an NC who is a stable boy and we have a at least an RC in the form of Needle Nose Ned himself. So the question becomes, even before you actually in, in, embark on an, a role play environment question, you have to ask yourself, how big is the role? And uh, Travis, I know with your experience in theater, that you know you understand this question quite well. Yes, you could be a, a piece of window dressing who walks onto the stage, makes one comment, and then goes and hides in the corner as dictated by the script. Or you could be... Uh, the prime, uh, I can't, you probably have to come up with a term, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, I know in the female role, it's the prima donna. I can't know what you call the male lead other than male lead. But if the role of the character is critical to the story, he becomes an SC. And now, therefore, you know that just because he's going to be an SC, it's a big enough role that you have to ask these other questions of yourself. Whereas if it was an NC, it might be the biggest role, he's just an NC. Next question, how much information does the NPC represent? For example, let's go back to the Zen C. You walk in and you drop off your horse and you go inside. That might be the extent of the conversation. However, oh, thanks. Of course it is, Travis, the star of the show. I get that. I get that. I thought maybe there was a, uh, I guess, a uh, uh, theater term, a French, like prima donna is in ballet or prima donna is in the opera world, I thought maybe there was a term operatically. That's what I was looking for. Uh, the, the information that the NPC might represent might be more. For example, you bring in your horse, you talk to the stable boy. Instead of just letting it go that he's a stable boy, you might toss the stable boy a copper and say, good man, where might I find a fine meal after this establishment at the bar? Now you've given a reason for that NC to have either a voice or at least information. So knowing that the NC needs information or may, might, be available, might be an option for information, realize that NPC roles can't ever get smaller. They only become bigger. So in other words, if you, if you intend for them to talk to Needle Nose Net, then the stable boy shouldn't have a lot of information. Otherwise, they clearly could talk to the stable boy, decide this bar isn't the right one, and go someplace else. And therefore, all the time you took to create Needle Nose Ned is now gone. So how much information the NPC represents is critical to how big the role is for that NC or that SC or RC. OK, so the next question is, what? how do the players respond to him? If they just jump off their horse, drop the reins, and away they go, uh, so be it. We're done. Good, NC's gone. We don't ever have to see him again in that role. Uh, matter of fact, that means you could use the description of the NC later on someplace else, and odds are the players won't recognize him. Of course, the very thought that they might itself is a, a story hook, but that's just how my brain works. So let's now talk about what defines the NPC. Uh, all right. Gotcha. Thank you, Travis. I, he, as you noted in the comments, he's answered the question about what you call the lead. All right. So the, the next thing you have to look at is not only how the players respond to it, but what are you going to use to define the NP, N, NPC to the players? And this is where we have to get done to the brass tacks. We'll get into the specifics of it when we get to the back, back to those different roles directly. But what defines the N, N, NPC to the character is how much you want them to be interested in him. The more you give them, the more they're going to pick up on your desire for them to interact. So, for example, if, as I started with, you ride up, the stable boy comes out quickly, takes the reins of your horse and leads it to the paddock, done. Quick, gone. We don't even know how tall a stable boy is, how old he is, we don't care. We, he's just got grabbed the horse and he's gone. 
If, on the other hand, I went into that long detail uh, where M Marty Feldman is the, the stable boy wearing the uh, Igor slash Igor hump on his right shoulder or whatever, I've now made it so the characters are going to want to know more information. So that leads to the next question of, in, the, in this, this test of, the, of, of an NPC is, what can the players learn about him? If he's engaging enough, if you've described him deeply enough, he may even become the topic of conversation once the players have entered the bar and started talking to needle nose. They might ask, why are you using this old man as your stable boy? Can't you afford a regular one or whatever? They, 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 the conversation starters are basically what you put into it. So just realize that when you're creating an NC, the more you put, the, 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 the less you put into it, the less significant it will be to the player. Next is, what is the value of sustained extending the conversation or interaction? If the NC was intentionally bland, and you did not want them to interact, once they interact, don't give them any information. Isolate what you're going to allow that NC to know. The, the, the more you put into what he knows, the more the players have options to dig. So for your sake, in order to maintain the consistency of your NCs, you have to make sure that you give them little, and then when they do respond, they don't don't respond much. For example, if I had over-explained that the uh, stable boy was an old man, and the players wanted to ask him information, I'm right back. Put him in a situation where the NC is unpalatable, undesirable to talk to, and the players will wander away. So just make sure that you have you can monitor, but remember you can never take away from the. Hey Robert, thanks for joining. Travis is with us as well, and we're talking about non-player characters. Uh, we're in the middle of the specific discussion of the analysis of the NPC as you're building it for your story. So the next thing beyond what de what how the character is defined, how the players interact with it. The value of the derived conversation is, again, going to deepen. The, the, the more the character moves from NC to RC or SC, the more value you want to build into them knowing this person. Getting to know the barkeep is cool. Getting to know the barkeep that it has information about the operation of a gang. We'll come back to that, that answer. You got a great question there, Travis. Um, I will bring that up, and you'll find that it will yeah, actually hit that a little bit later. And once again, this proves what we were talking about last night uh, at table. When we uh, are doing things, you like your brain's racing way ahead of me. So please hold on to it. We'll definitely come back and answer that question in a bit. But uh, we're not going to handle it at this point. Um, and then finally. This leads to the final question, how deep is the NPC rabbit hole? And actually, this is actually going to be the exact point of, of where you were asking. Once you have a player, when, once you have an RC that the players are currently worrying to death and are going to be turning into or trying to turn into either an RC or an SC, it's up to you to control the environment. And uh, to that point, you have to be uh, on the fine line of being in character when you do so. So, for example, uh, the most extreme case, if this old man whom you didn't want the players to interact with has become the center of conversation and they just have all gotten off their horses and they're now arguing with this old man about whether he has made poor life choices and maybe he should get off the bottle and stop being a, 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 a stable boy and should you know, move on with his life. If this should happen, of course, the most extreme form of escape could be a sudden and rather fatal heart attack on the part of the old man. The death of the character is the most extreme version of how you get out of that. But the, the, the shallower answer to that, and the question that Travis actually asked is, what if they decide to focus almost everything on one NPC, not one of the non-characters? You have two choices. Continue to stipulate that he is only boring and that he doesn't know anything to the point where they finally throw up their hands and quit. Or let's slip one critical piece of information 
as part of a, you know, like, as I said, if he's a drunk guy, he's like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. You're confusing me. I don't know. I just, just, you should, you should ask the gray man. And then you're back into uh, incessant nonsense. But always, if they ever come back to it, just keep dropping the hint. They should talk to the gray man. This is how you get them off of an N uh, NC that you really didn't want them talking to anyway. If you've already opened the door and their your party wants to talk to them, two choices: you either acquiesce to their request and make him an SC or an RC, and therefore change your plan, dropping somebody else out so that you're not running multiple critical important critically important characters. Because the the reality is the nuance of this is that you as the game master. This is going to be kind of critical. You as a game master should have as few characters sympathetic to the players as possible. They should be, to the greatest extent possible, on their own. We'll go into the details of, of, of how that would fall in a minute, but just realize that the more people you give them to interact with, the more confused they will be and the less focused they will be on the story you intend. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the essence of identity. And there are probably a million ways you could define this. I'm going to be using seven. I'm going to be speaking of uh, your location, the connection that's available, how affable the player, the, the uh, NC or SC is, or actually SC or RC is, their inherent in, uh, curiosity and inquisitiveness their attraction and attractiveness, their temperament and personality, and their openness or isolationism, isolationist tendencies. So therefore, think of it this way. In, in the olden times, yes, back before even I was a child, I know it's barely possible that actually ever existed, but people got to be known by the location from which they came. So if you were from, uh, say, St. Louis, Missouri, you might be known as Missouri Jim, or you might be uh, Texarkana Phil or whatever. So location is a clear identifi an identifier of location, uh, of identity. As a matter of fact, back in uh, the long agos, people would actually take on names that divined who they were. So Peter's son, Peterson. That means the connection. Um, Miller, okay, his job's Miller, so it's his, his career. Um, if you are uh, from the German city of Hausen, your name might be von Hausen. So location is an identifier. It, it makes the people know who you are. So if you say, oh, yeah, that's a needle nose bill from, from Phil's tavern. Now you know that needle nose uh, Ned works at Phil's. So now you've got two connections. Um, so the location is critically important. And it helps you define an NPC in, in other ways. For example, if a player says, I need to have a tooth pulled for whatever reason, I need to go to the, a barber or a surgeon, where would I find one? The, the town can simply say, oh, you're looking for you know, Sven. And he works over behind uh, Phil's. There's a little shop behind Phil's there. They pull teeth. So now you're giving them not only information about the NC or the NPC or the SCRC, but you're giving them information about the world you're in, which adds gravity. It adds what I call, um, I call gravity, I, I call the, the, the foothold that the players need to be able to push off against the adventure. The second element of identity is connection. How do we know each other? How did that NPC come to be in your life? Well, clearly, if you walked into Phil's tavern and Ned happens to be on, on, on staff that day, the RC you're going to meet there, the, the recurring character you're going to meet there, is probably going to be Needle Nose Ned. 
I said, I'm so glad you're here because we have we have to really make this connection because I have I have a problem with with instability of my my clientele. So if you would please be sure to stop by Phil's whenever you have an opportunity, and in particular whenever you need information on uh, the operation of the uh, uh, Black Network. By making a connection between the uh, recurring character or even the story character, you're you're going to draw, draw the the identity of Ned becomes deeper because you now know where you can find him. Affability. If Needle Nose Ned had rushed over to your table to bring you a drink even before you sat down or he had a, a small beer or a even just a simple uh, tankard of, of uh, the local ale or whatever, he's showing how affable he is and this builds into the non-player character a sense of a desire to be connected. Uh, if the uh, NC, I mean I'm sorry, if the uh, NPC shows a great interest in what the players are doing, whether it's desired or not, that level of curiosity helps to define the identity. You now that that incessant nine-year-old that keeps coming in here and asking me if I want a puppy. You want a puppy? I got a puppy. You want a puppy? There's a there's an attraction to to that NPC, and there's a curiosity that gets built. And obviously, if a if I have in the story a nine-year-old boy trying to get you to take a puppy, you a puppy. You want him? I know you do. He's a white little bitty toy. The The development of the story is amplified because now I want to know more about why there's a nine-year-old in, in a tavern, first of all. Second of all, what's up with the puppy dog and why is this kid not, not leaving us alone? Next is temperament. If, again, Ned's had a bad day and he doesn't have enough clientele and, and you're not drinking enough and he's concerned, his personal... Uh, passion is going to come out and it's going to help you identify that a guy if it's a, a needle nose Ned the nervous guy you know from over at Phil's you're amplifying the, the value of that NC or that I think I keep using the wrong term and that, that RC or SC and then finally openness and this is if he's a chatty Kathy and he's going to talk off your leg and he's going to give you information both useful and non-useful this helps you identify him. If it's the, oh, I was just down talking to the town gossip and everyone knows that's Needle Nose Ned because everybody's had a conversation with him, pretty soon you can be identifying the NPCs. Uh, even when they're not in the room, the players can, can, can recognize from conversation who is whom. So this is uh, really important to defining or giving identity to your uh, NPCs. And again, notice that the more of these you put into uh, an NPC, the more likely it is the players are going to interact with them. So the flatter you need the character to be, the, least, the less of these you focus on. So now we're going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to take, a, uh, actually I'm going to go back and talk a little bit more about the definitions of RC and uh, SC. I know I spoke about it earlier, but I want to get a clarification of it. A character that's carrying information that's critical to the story, whether it be a one-shot interaction or if it be an ongoing relationship, that is a story character. So literally, a guy that walks in, makes a dying utterance, and falls dead on the floor can be a story character. So realize that, 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 that the, the amount of time they interact with somebody does not make them more important. And this is kind of critical when you're telling a story and there's a lot of places where the, the, the uh, PCs can go back to. For example, I'm going to mention him and uh, I know I'm going to get a, probably get some kind of response from Travis on this, but old Zoblob, the, in, the, the little storekeeper is a recurring character. He does not necessarily provide information that's helpful to the story but he's certainly fun to interact with. And so to realize that a recurring character does not have to be a story character is critically important. 
so that you don't end up overusing a recurring character to give story elements to the players such that they feel like they're being led or guided by that uh, NPC. Uh, so just I wanted to clarify that because I don't think I made it clear earlier that a story character can be a one shot. He can be somebody who just walks in and makes his statement, crosses the stage. Uh, I guess it's similar to the uh, the idea that an NPC might move through a story and provide the players with a prophecy and then never be visible again because that was, you know, a spirit of a dead guy or something. The, the criticality of the information can be greater than the role of the character such that you won't necessarily see them more than once. All right, so now let's move on to the next part of dealing with an NPC in a story, and that is the timing and the tempo of the interaction. Uh, again, Travis's musical background, he probably has a really keen sense of this, but there's a difference between timing and tempo, even though the words basically stem from the same concept. Uh, the, the timing of an event has to do with its chronological order. In other words, if the players cannot gain information on X until some action has occurred, no matter which NPCs they run into, they shouldn't have access to that information because it's out of timing. It's not yet available. For example, if you have a contest going on for the most beautiful woman in the city or whatever, you need to have that, have the person who knows that answer not give that answer until the contest has been held. Beyond the duration of the encounter, you also have to worry about the availability for further or ongoing conversation. If you want a character to be an RC, let that be the case, but don't necessarily meet, hold, um, put them in that role unless you really want to have them meet with them again. I had a, a guy one time that had a, a voice like a frog, and I hated doing the frog voice because it's so hard on the throat to talk like this. So I didn't want the players to interact with the frog guy because it was a, just rough on me. Ironically, I had made a mistake and that became a recurring character because they kept going by the pond to see if he had found out yet who the princess was. Because the, the, the ongoing joke is that he was going around kissing other frogs, hoping to find the princess among them who could then kiss him back and turn him into a prince. Anyway, that, that bit of story that I put into that NPC switched him from being a single shot SC to being an ongoing RC. So be careful when you do this so that you make sure that you want the characters that they want to talk to uh, be the ones that they go find. And again, you can discourage them by you know, reducing the information or making his conversation dull, boring, whatever, drive out the intent. Um, the third thing to take into account is the condition of the time of the interaction. So what is going on? If it's a rainstorm and they're talking to a thunder god, that, that might be a clue on how they would have to interact to talk with this guy again. Um, also, it might be you know, just before the rising of the second full moon or something. Realize also that the attention that players give to an NPC can help solidify or calcify uh, a, a, a non-player character into the role that you have for it or perhaps one that you never intended. So we have to make sure you keep track of that too. And that that is actually a reference to the tempo. If if the NPC every day gives them one clue, no matter how much they badger him, they know they can get at least one clue from him every time they interact. Guess what? They're going to interact with him every day until you stop giving clues. So make sure that you don't overindulge in player acquiescence by giving them information from a source that shouldn't have it. Uh, next is the speech patterns, idiosyncrasies, and vocabulary. Uh, this helps to define the role of an NPC, but it also indicates uh, items of 
necessity to the players. Don't know why that point's in here. I made, made a mistake there. Um, another key to the tempo is the precision of the detail. If a guy is telling a story, but you've made it out so that he's rather vague, they're going to keep badgering him until he gives more information. So realize that you need to be able to control the, the knowledge of the uh, uh, SC or RC or even the NC to make sure that they don't have more information than they should have. And then ultimately, is the information useful? For example, Needle Nose Ned, we already said, is a gossip. Maybe all he knows is gossip that's, uh, you know, underwear stories of the, the, the rich and famous or these strange, odd titles. Maybe his data is not useful to the players. So this will help to maintain the tempo of their contact and how often they try to reach him. Okay, we are running up against the clock now, coming up on the end, so I'm going to have to whisk through uh, this next part. Um, maintaining source con uh, continuity. When you have a cast of NPCs, a cast of characters in the story that you are playing, you have to be very careful not to cross wires because there are times when they will ask to talk to an N an RC that uh, that doesn't have information, but you have been thinking in circles about the information, and so therefore you blurt out something that that uh, RC shouldn't know. So you got to make sure not to cross your wires. So that, that's the reason why you want to build affectations and voices for your RCs and SCs so that the players know exactly whom they are speaking with. Um, you don't want characters that are too similar. You don't want uh, characters that are confusing. So when you create RCs and SCs, you want to make sure that they are definable in such a way that you can't, that a player can't get lost in them. <laughs> nice comment there, Travis. I hadn't seen that one. That's very funny. Nice, nice. All right, so I haven't been watching the notes. So I'll have to go back and read those in a little while, but let me go back here. Um, if characters are confusing, if you've got more than one that have information that's similar, you're going to be in trouble as well as the players are because you might share information you don't really want to. The next thing is you've got to hold on to the purpose of the conversation. Old Zob Lob is a great example. I could sit and play Zoblob all day and you could find objects and trinkets in his shop to talk about and he would have stories forever. Therefore, I have to make sure that when you are visiting old Zoblob's shop that you are there for a specific purpose and that I answer whatever questions you're looking for. So at some point I can say, okay, well, old Zoblob start yawns a bit and says he's going to have to close the shop for his lunch break. Thank you for playing. Move along. <laughs> so make sure you hold on to the purpose for the NPC and encounter, otherwise you can get caught in a trap of talking as an NPC in the clever voice that everybody likes for too long. Also, avoid over-enthusiasm. This is something that I myself have been uh, accused of, and that is once I get into an NPC role, I really enjoy playing that NPC to the point where people are like sick of them. Now, it hasn't happened yet. I've been really fortunate with Angus, but I really kind of like that old Tarm Tarmachian, I mean, you know, he's always pushing that chaw in the corner of the mountain, has so many wise old western sayings that just, okay, I just have to stop, okay. <laughs> Make sure you don't get overly enthusiastic with an NPC, because that will also cause you to perhaps give more information than you want to, or build interest in an NPC you didn't intend. Next is build tension. Quite often you can build tension in a conversation simply by stopping the answering of questions suddenly. So be careful that when you are finished with a story between two NPCs and a player, or uh, between a, an NPC and a player that you don't cut them off too abruptly or else you create an unnecessary tension that you don't want to have to handle or have to explain or have to build a story around. Ultimately, it means you got to know how to say when. You got to say, okay, yeah, you've had fun with Angus, but it's it's time to hit the range. It's got to stop by the porta potty outside or whatever, and then remember to conclude the connection. So you want to make sure that when they leave the story, if they are RCs, they remind the players, oh, feel free to come back. Feel free to come back by needle nets whenever you feel the need for a, a bit of ale. Yes. All right, so finally, let's move on to the next couple of sections. We are really racing on time here. 
role playing versus role playing. I have a whole section in the academy that goes into how to differentiate these two. Uh, the clearest answer is when a player is intimidated by playing a character in character, don't let them off the hook. <laughs> that sounds counterintuitive, but a player who has difficulty in communicating through role play needs role play to be a better communicator because there is no safer environment in human communication than when I'm wanting you to finish your conversation, I wanna hear what you have to say. So definitely as when you are in the role play environment, make sure you know clearly where the lines are so that you don't let players off the hook and let them roll dice. Conversely, if a player is really accomplished at conversation, has a great skill for it and could eat up hours of your time just being clever and charming with an NPC, recognize when it's possible for you just simply say, okay, you've, you've, you've had your conversation, it's clear where you're headed in this, uh, the NPC is now going to roll the uh, bluff check to see whether or not they buy what you're saying, and then just move on. Role playing with the dice is the most common malady of players coming from the computer, computer game world because they're everything is statistics. So they are the group arguably that you'll have to spend more time in actual role play with. But just realize that when you do so, you are building a relationship with an NPC and whether that was intended to be or not, an ongoing conversation with an NC will make it automatically an RC. And the characters that have information don't necessarily have to be ongoing characters, which will keep the players from needling and wheedling your NPCs. Now, finally, one little snippet of information. There's an entire section in the Academy on this, but uh, uh, dealing with multiple NPCs in an encounter, thank God for swivel chairs. What I recommend is when you have multiple personalities you're trying to resolve, in order to make it work, slide yourself back from your table a bit, make sure you swivel to one side or the other, so that you can clearly be doing the needle nose, needle nose Ned voice while facing this direction. Oh, I'm a bar guy out in the, the bar, and I came in to get a drink because I can't handle talking to those player characters. I've told you time and again not to bother the customers. By switching your facing, you're giving the players a clear identity of point of view. When you switch to the other side and, and interact in the other side with the other voice, you let them see that those are two separate personalities. Then it becomes absolutely critical that when you're giving information that you're facing the right way to give out the information you want to give and facing and, and not giving information out through the facing that you don't intend for the information to be used. Uh, we are at the end of time for today. I want to thank you all for your participation. I will go back and read the notes and give comments. Make sure that you, uh, if you're not a member, or if you're not uh, on this page, to go ahead and like it and follow it. Also, uh, like and follow uh, my regular account for updates. Uh, we'll be introducing more players to this format for the tapings coming up in the future. I am Jonathan Albin the Game Market Guru for Just In Time Productions, Games Mastery Academy, Series 3. Thank you guys and have a great day.